Hi, and welcome to Focal Point AFR Talk, free for all Father's Day uh, Friday. 888-589-8840 is the number to call. And again, we're just going to take calls today on one topic and one topic only, some positive memory that you have about your dad. We want to honor dads today. As I've mentioned before, typically again, Father's Day, you go to church and, and the pastor pulls out the biggest Louisville slugger he can find, <laughs> starts beating us about the head and shoulders. And we want to take a little different tack today. We want to uplift fathers. We want to honor the fathers. You know, we're told in the scriptures, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and you may live long on the earth. In other words, honoring our parents, both mother and father, is a key component to physical and mental and emotional health. And it's also a key to longevity. And the command to honor our parents, we may not always have the responsibility to obey them. When we leave home, we go out on our own, uh, then we're no longer responsible to obey them. We're no longer obligated to obey them. You have some kind of interim period there where you're in college and you're still dependent upon them and you come home at breaks and stay under their roof of uh, their home. I think you have a pretty high sense of responsibility and obligation to follow their lead wherever you can. But once you get out on your own, you're your own adult living on your own, supporting yourself. You're not responsible to obey your parents any longer, but you never are relieved of the responsibility before God to honor our parents. We want to take some time uh, to do that today. And to kind of set the stage for that, uh, uh, I want to give you my nominee for the father of the year. And this might give you somebody to root for if you follow the U.S. Open. That's a great story. I had this yesterday, but I didn't have a chance to get to it. So we'll talk about it today. This is a story about Phil Mickelson. Now, Phil Mickelson, to me, he, he's a terrific guy. I mean, you just look at him. He seems like a friendly guy. He's always got a smile on his face. He's obviously very committed to his wife, Amy, and to their uh, family. Uh, and and I, I just even find it intriguing to watch the way he walks down the fairway. You know, if you went to the dictionary and you looked up the word amble, there'd be a picture of, of Phil Mickelson right there. He doesn't walk down the fairway. He ambles. He just kind of shuffles along. But just seems like just a really, really decent guy and very popular uh, on the tour, both among fellow players and among fans, and the U.S. Open is being played this weekend. This is the premier golf tournament in all of golf. I mean, if you're going to put one tournament at the top of the heap, it would be the U.S. Open. you got the Masters as a major, the British Open as a major, the PGA as a major, but if you had to pick one of those four as the major major, it would be the U.S. Open. And it's a lifelong ambition of his to win this tournament. And he has finished second in the U.S. Open no less than five times. He's got the all-time record for U.S. Open futility. He's finished second five times, but he's never won. So this is obviously a big deal to him to win the U.S. Open. Well, the U.S. Open, the night before the U.S. Open began on Thursday, his daughter was graduating from the eighth grade, like at 9 p.m. I guess it would be 7 p.m. On the, on the West Coast or 6 p.m. on the West Coast, whatever it was. Anyway, she was graduating from the eighth grade, and she was giving a speech at her eighth grade graduation. I don't know if she's valedictorian or whatever, but she was giving a speech at her graduation. And Phil Mickelson lives in Southern California, like in the San Diego area, I think. And the U.S. Open is being played in at Marion Golf Club outside of Philadelphia in a place called Ardmore, Pennsylvania, all the way across the country. And his tea time was for 7-11. That's when he was, his tee time was for the first round of the U.S. Open yesterday morning. He had to tee off at 7-11. And his daughter was graduating the night before, Wednesday night, on the West Coast. Now, Mickelson, fortunately, because of his success, he has a $60 million private jet. It's a Gulfstream 5. So, and his daughter, his daughter said to him, look, Dad, Stay, it's the U.S. Open. I know how much you care about it, Mickelson said, and I told her, I want to be there. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss her speech. I don't want to miss her graduation. So he flew on his private jet. He flew from Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia, the closest airport, all the way across country to Southern California on Wednesday, 
so he could be there for his daughter's eighth grade graduation. And by the way, another backstory to this, back in 1999, Mickelson was in contention for the U.S. Open. He finished second that year. It was the first of his five second-place finishes, lost to Payne Stewart on the last day. And that weekend, his wife Amy was due with this daughter. She, his wife was due to give birth to this daughter that weekend. Mickelson is in second place in the U.S. Open. And he told everybody, including the press, said, look, I've got a beeper in my bag, and if that beeper goes off telling me that Amy is going into labor, I am out of here. I don't care if I'm in first place by five shots, I'm out of here. I'm going to be with my wife for the birth of our first child. So that gives you just some kind of flavor for the values the family values that this guy has. So anyway, he goes all the way to Southern California so he can be at his daughter's graduation, eighth grade graduation. This is the same daughter he was willing to bug out of the U.S. Open for if, she was, uh, if, if her mom was going into labor. And then he gets back on his jet and he flies all the way back to Philadelphia in the middle of the night. He gets in at 3 o'clock in the morning. He gets a one-hour nap. And then he heads out to the golf course to tee off in the first round of the U.S. Open, and he wound up shooting 67 yesterday, three under par, leading the field going into the second round today. So uh, that's got to be the father's story of the weekend. So if you're looking for somebody to root for uh, on Sunday, you can't go far wrong by rooting for Phil Mickelson. So we're taking calls today. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do content today. Don't worry about it. We're going to get to that. We're even going to talk about uh, – Uh, People in Japan licking other people's eyeballs. That'll freak you out. Jeff Reed's going to bring us that story. We're going to get to other content. We're going to talk about the IRS. We're going to talk about Syria. We're going to talk about the NSA spying on us. It's worse than you imagine. We'll get to all of that, but we want the focus today to be on fathers. So if you got a story about your father, to honor him, today's the day to do it, 888-589-8840. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to Ray in Tampa, Florida. Ray, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Uh, talk to me about your dad. Who, who's is this, Ray? Yeah, this is Ray. Yeah, you're you're on with Brian Fisher. Yeah. Go right ahead. Oh, okay. Hey, listen, man. First of all, Happy Father's Day. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, I got to tell uh, you, listen, I I have a couple things about my dad. Uh, I'm from Michigan originally, so my dad loved to fish, and we'd go up north a lot. And um, uh, the, the, uh, that's one of the greatest memories I have of just going out. Man, I when he went out. He went out and he caught fish where nobody else was living because he knew the fish was there and if there's no uh, amenities, he knew the fishing would be better. So he was a real wise man about how to go go get fish. Um, One time I almost lost him in a storm, actually. I wasn't with him on the fishing trip, but he was out there with my brother and his wife, his uh, then wife, and uh, a storm, a bad storm came up and everybody came in and they said, there's one guy out there. And uh, it didn't look like he was coming in. And, oh, my God, we, my mother was beside herself. And so we almost lost him one time. Um, but um, I, another thing about my dad was uh, he was not a Christian, but he tithed. Hmm. He was a chiropractor. Um, and he was, so he was, you know, he was self-employed. Um, but he always tithed 20%. And I tell you, I was, I'm the youngest of three, and I was raised like a little prince. I mean, I had everything. Um, he was so financially secure, we traveled. Um, he had any kind of food he wanted. He always dressed in a custom-made suit. I mean, he really had, and it just goes to prove, prove the blessing of the tithe. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the two things I just wanted to share with you, Brian. All right. Well, listen, uh, thank you very much, Ray. I appreciate that. That's Ray from Tampa, Florida. And, uh, Ray, I, I'm, I, I'm just telling you this story. I, I'm not telling you this story in any way about your father. I'm just telling you what I used to. I had a lot of friends that loved to fish in Idaho, and, you know, people do a lot of fishing in Idaho. Fly fishing is big there cutthroat, rainbow trout, salmon, everybody loves to fish there. That gene just got completely left out of my chromosomal makeup. I have absolutely zero interest in fishing. I like to play golf, and I like to go. I, I'm happy to go with friends and sit on the bank and just kind of relax and puff on a pipe and, and watch the, the river go by. I got no interest in getting my hands on a slimy fish I just got on a hook. So uh, I used to tease my friends. They'd be so excited about the fish they caught and how much they weighed and how big they were. And I said, man, I mean, it's going to be a long day before I brag about outsmarting something that's got an IQ that's smaller than my hat size. 
But that didn't seem to slow them down. They were still proud of the uh, fish they caught. Let's go to Susie in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Suey, welcome to Fo- uh, I mean, Susie, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Hello, and it's Lovelaceville, Kentucky. It's oh, Lovelaceville. I'm sorry about that. My bad. That's exactly that's what it says on my screen. I'd never heard of it, so I took a wild <laughs> guess. I apologize. Okay. Uh, I want to tell you something that I've said all my adult life, but uh, never thought I'd get to say it on national radio, that's for sure, uh, about my father. He was not my biological father. He was my grandfather. Uh, him and my grandmother adopted us when I was about two and a half years old, I guess. Now, there were six of us, and they adopted every one of us, so we all stayed together. Um, of course, they were from the Depression you know, era and stuff, because that was like about 40 years, 50 years ago. Um, but I have always, in my mind, have had a thankfulness that I cannot even imagine where my life would have been led had Hmm. they not taken that step Hmm. to take all of us and raise us together. Now, he was a farmer, so he worked hard, raised cows, tobacco, baled hay, and she was right out there, you know, with them, too. Um, Made sure that we went to church. Now, he was not an avid churchgoer. Uh, He was a Christian, but not an avid churchgoer until later on in his life. Um, But... um, I truly feel, now this all happened due to my biological mother not, you know, making some bad decisions, Mm -hmm. but um, that is one thing that that God has instilled in me, and they've both been dead for probably 20 years now, but I still think about that very, very often on at least a weekly basis of where my life would have been led had they not intercepted and God put them there too. All right, Susan. Listen, that's a great story. Thank you very much for that. You know, and you know, and, and grandparents uh, playing a critical role in the lives of a lot of children these days because we've got so, so much, so many families, so many marriages in crisis, and grandparents a lot of times stepping into the vacuum that's created by this kind of dysfunction that we have in a lot of marriages today. And there are a lot of uh, couples that adopt children. We've got some very good friends that have adopted four children. Got some uh, co-workers here that are adopting kids. And, you know, literally, they are saving the lives of those children. You look at the circumstances from which those children come, those children would have no chance at life if these parents, these couples, had not loved them enough to adopt them, to choose willingly to bring them into their home and provide them with cover and shelter and love. Focal Point AFR Talk back in two minutes. Stay with us. 